Well, as I was introduced before by, by, the, by, um, by the other Brian here, there's two Brian's here tonight. Larry wanted me to talk about Gulp, the conservative case for a carbon tax. I guess he knows that I like to skydive, I'm into ad adventure seeking. So here I'm gonna talk about how taxes are good for you and a tax that you'll actually like if you're a conservative. Boy, we set the bar high here, didn't we? <laughs> now, question for you guys, especially for, <coughs> I hate to say this, maybe the older members of our audience here. Does anybody know who the first world leader was to address the United Nations on climate change? Richard Nixon? No, not Richard Nixon. Eisenhower. I'm sorry? Eisenhower. No, more recent than Eisenhower. It was actually British Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher in 1989. She was called the Iron Iron Lady. I almost called her Iron Maiden. Iron Lady. <laughs> Different group there. Iron Lady. And because she was known for her conservative politics. And she was had a great relationship with our American president, conservative time Ronald Reagan. They had what was called the special relationship because how closely they liked to work together on conservative issues across both sides of the pond. And she said this in 1989 about climate change. She was actually, her first, she studied chemistry in college. So she was actually a scientist herself. So she was very easy to understand the science of climate change. So in 1989, and this is what she told the United Nations. She said, what we are doing now to the world by degrading the land surfaces, polluting the waters, and by adding greenhouse gases to the air at an unprecedented rate, all this is a new, new in the experience of the earth. It is mankind, this is key right here, this is mankind's activities, which is changing the environment of our planet and damaging it in dangerous ways. She went on to say that. We, not, we know more now clearly than before that on our planet Earth, that we carry common burdens, face common problems, we must respond with common action. And this, is what, this was her address in 1989. And go look it up on YouTube. It's quite an address that she gave the United Nations about climate change. You know, remember this gentleman here? I guess we're going to date ourselves in this audience. <laughs> Former Secretary of State George Shultz. He's kind of, like, in some ways, the elder statesman of the Republican Party now. This is what he said, out, said about conservatives being leaders on the environment. It's not just Margaret Thatcher, many of us have heard about Teddy Roosevelt 100 years ago, creating many national parks, which is dear to my heart. But this is what George Shultz said about Republicans and conservatives. He said, let me remind you, there was a Republican president who established the EPA, which was Nixon. Richard Nixon. It was a Republican president that did the Montreal Protocol. Anybody know who that was? It was Ronald Reagan. Yeah, Ronald Reagan, and that was actually trying to fix the hole in the ozone. It was Reagan and Thatcher and conservatives and all across the spectrum working together to get that treaty together. It was a Republican president that did cap and trade. Anybody know who that was? That was the first George Bush, George H.W. Bush, that would reduce, that was the second Clean Air Act, re reduce some of the emissions in our atmosphere, that dealt with acid rain. So Republicans have, and conservatives have been leaders on this issue. He goes on to say that good work on conservation and the environment is in the Republican gene. And for, we've been the guys who did it. We just have to get back to that. Now keep in mind that George Shultz was not just Secretary of State. He was also an economist. And not just an economist, one of the top economists. He was an economics professor at MIT and the University of Chicago. And my, and my understanding is the University of Chicago produces more Nobel laureates in economics than any other school, and correct me if I'm wrong about that, but that's, that's what I've heard. And he was even the dean of the School of Business from 1960 to 1969. So he was, he was also a top economist. And wearing his economist hat, this is what he said, he goes, a clearly a revenue neutral carbon tax would benefit all Americans by eliminating the need for costly energy subsidies while promoting a level playing field for energy producers. This was an editorial that he wrote just last year in the Wall Street Journal, why we need a revenue neutral carbon tax. And there's other conservative economists, many conservative economists that have stepped up, stepped up and said the same thing. One of them is Greg Mankiw. Greg Mankiw was President George W. Bush's chief economic advisor, and he's also 
the leading economic advisor for Mitt Romney before and when he was running for president. Another top conservative economic <laughs> advisor, Art Laffer, leading economic advisor for Ronald Reagan. These are all guys that support a carbon tax. Douglas Holst Eakin, he was a chief economic advisor for John McCain when John McCain ran for president in 2008. And Kevin Hassett, he was also, the, he's a director of economic policy studies for the American Enterprise Institute, probably one of the top conservative think tanks in the US. And he was also a top advisor for John McCain during his presidential campaign. And it's not just economic advisors, there's some big conservatives that come out in favor of carbon tax. Such as, anybody heard of this guy right here? George Will. Yeah, commentator on Fox News and ABC News. And so what happened is that he went to see an economic presentation by a gentleman, Yoman, Bo Yoman, Yom Yoman Borman, hard name to say. He calls himself the stand-up economist. I'm serious. He calls him. So he, he, he gives lectures on economy, and he tells a lot of jokes, too, even funnier than me. <laughs> and so he was talking about how we need a revenue-neutral carbon tax. And George Will was agreeing with him. He was saying, that is a great idea. And so when he had a one-on-one -on -one conversation with him saying that, okay, that's great that you like the carbon tax, but do you realize that by endorsing the carbon tax, you're also agreeing with this guy, <laughs> Al Gore? George Will, you're agreeing with Al Gore? And you know what um, George Will's response was? He said that an idea should not be re held responsible by the people who believe in it. <laughs> <laughs> so if it's a good idea, it's a good idea, whether it comes from a conservative or a liberal or agnostic or whoever it comes from. It's a, it's a, a good idea is a good idea. And this is why conservative economists like a carbon tax, because they're basically saying, that we should be taxing what we burn, our pollution, and not what we earn. Who here likes a payroll tax? None of us do. Conservative economists hate it. They would much rather lower the, the pay, payroll tax, that way we have more money to spend and boost our economy, than taking all that money away from us in a payroll tax. And so what conservative economists, and economists actually across the political spectrum will tell you, that if you wanna get less pollution, <coughs> one of the best ways to do it is you make pollution expensive. My understanding is that in the early 1960s, half of the American population smoked. And as you learned over the years, when you smoke, it causes cancer, not just to you, to others in the room. That's why we can't smoke in this room tonight. Here, so the, the, the norms of society changed, but also cigarette taxes went up. And so it became more and more expensive for smokers. So now we went from 50%, to 20% of the population smoking, to become a healthier society as a result. And so this is what a carbon tax does. It helps you get less of this pollution. Who here likes pollution? <laughs> Nobody does, do they? Who here likes taxes? Carbon tax helps you get less taxes here and helps you get more money in your pocket and actually a cleaner air. And the leading group to th that that's a proponent of this, a group that I'm involved with and I'm so excited about this, is Citizens Climate Lobby. They have over, at least over 150 groups across the United States. And what they're doing is they're trying to establish positive relationships with members of co Congress and the media to get a revenue neutral carbon tax, tax passed. And this is what they're, what they're proposing. And why this is why conservatives have really bought into it and they really like it here also. The tax is based upon carbon-based fuels at the source. So when it's mined from a coal, when it comes out of an oil well, or at the border coming into our United States, if it's coming in on, on a tanker, et cetera. So you tax it. You tax it about $15 a ton. So to raise your price of gasoline by about 15 cents a gallon. And it steadily increases each year, about $10 a year on that ton to make, that, make the dirty, polluting fuels more and more expensive. But what you do then is you just don't tax it. You actually return all of it to the American Republic in dividend checks on an equitable basis. And under this plan, over two thirds of the American population, especially the poor and middle class, they would actually come out ahead in this. Because if you don't do it, the poor and middle class, the taxes go up for them and they're left even further behind. But by doing this, it helps them actually come out ahead. And then so what happens then is that fossil fuel pollution, the pollution that we don't want, the pollution that's harming our kids and harming ourselves, 
that goes up and up and up, but the clean stuff for us, the solar and wind, the thing that does not harm our health, that actually gets cheaper and cheaper. It helps us become even healthier as a population, just as reducing smoking did. And so are carbon taxes successful? Well, the answer is actually a big yes. There's been, around, there's been one around in British Columbia since 2008. And this is the amount of revenue they've collected. And this is how what, what they've over $3 billion. And they've actually been able to reduce their taxes by over $4 billion. And actually, their business taxes have gone down, which makes conservatives really happy. They have the lowest business tax rate in G7, basically European, Western European, in, in America and in Japan. Their income taxes have fallen down too. Who would like to pay less in income taxes? This has actually helped out people in British Columbia, so this tax has been proved to be very popular. And their personal income taxes have gone down also. So that's great, the taxes are going down, but is it actually helping clean up the environment? And the answer is actually a big yes. Because the rest of Canada is actually flat line is with, with petroleum use. But look at, at carbon tax starts in 2008. It's been steadily decreasing in British Columbia. So it can prove to be very successful. And this is actually a very conservative idea. I have, anybody that's more interested in the subject, I encourage you to actually look up this site on the internet. It's the, the Energy and Enterprise Institute, which is run by this gentleman right here, conservative Republican, former Congressman Bob Ingram, to learn more about how a carbon tax is actually beneficial. So how is a carbon tax beneficial? Why should conservatives, and who in, who in this room is conservative here? So we got a couple conservatives, so you're my audi audience here tonight. But the rest of you can still listen in, though. <laughs> Why is a revenue neutral carbon tax beneficial? Number one, it does not add to the federal deficit or to the federal debt. It's revenue neutral. So it doesn't do that. And number two, it doesn't grow the size of the government because you don't have another big government bureaucracy being added. There's no Social Security Administration, there's no Homeland Security, no Medicaid, Medicare, or any of those. A lot of those government agencies that we don't add, there's nothing like that that's, that's added with the revenue neutral carbon tax. And that's because it's a very easy to administer. You do it already through the Department of the Treasury. The mechanism is in place. Who here receives a social security check? Anybody here receives? Yeah, so what it is is that check is cut to you once a month, and the same thing with that dividend check. It'll be cut to you once a month. And every single American would get this check on an equitable basis. And so they say for the carbon tax, with the money that's brought in, only about 0.5% of minuscule amount with the administrative fee. So you, bet, you don't have to add any kind of bureaucracy or federal agency. You do this with the, the, with the existing mechanisms already. It's also easy to minister because Alaska does it. There's actually states that are doing this already. The Alaska Permanent Fund. And if, if you talk to your sister, they, they, like, they like it up there. So it's expensive to live in Alaska, but when you drill for oil in Alaska, you have extra taxes, and those taxes go back to the citizens of Alaska. In 2013, every single resident of Alaska got $900 back. So yeah, it's really easy to administer. It's been done already. It's done in British Columbia. We, we can do it already with the mechanisms in place. And number four, it's not as confusing as cap and trade. Cap and trade is very convoluted and confusing. Basically, if you're polluting less, you sell your credits to those that are polluting more. And this is kind of the convoluted way that cap and trade it works, and that's why today kind of conservatives and, and liberals hate it, how, con how convoluted and confusing it is. Where well, this is very simple. The more you pollute, the more you pay in taxes. The less you pollute, the less you pay in taxes. Very, very simple. And number five, it lets the free market, not the government, pick the winners. And who's heard of Solyndra before? Yeah, where the Obama administration had given a tax break to a solar firm that ended up going belly up. Well, this way, instead of the government picking winners and losers, the free market does. Number six, it increases jobs. Who wants a job like that? <laughs> Yeah, well, I, well, I've skydived twice, so I've, 
there's a small part of me that'd be interested in doing that. On a dare, I would do that. But most days I have a fear of heights, so I know I wouldn't do it. But green jobs overall, renewable jobs, and Corinne alluded to this already, according to Los Angeles Times last year, green renewable jobs are all outpacing all other job sectors by a factor of four. Imagine how much even more we would get if we went all in with renewables, and a, and a carbon revenue neutral carbon tax would help us get there. And keep this in mind too, that as far as renewable energy, we're actually getting our butts kicked right, kicked right now by China and Europe. Last year we spent about 40, we invested about 48 million dollars in renewable energy. China spent 63, Europe 57. So when we're looking to make parts for solar, turb so so solar panels and wind turbines, and we'll set it backwards there, we want that made in America, don't we? We don't want that made overseas. And so by investing more into that, that helps us, our businesses, the core, and I, I love that slide before, the solar firms and the wind turbine firms in, in Missouri, that helps our local firms grow. And so many countries already have a carbon tax or cap and trade. Mexico to the south, there's British Columbia, that's actually not listed there, most of Europe. China has actually implemented a cap and trade. They're getting the process they've implemented across their country, they're, they're gonna link with Australia, so many countries are doing it already. So to remain competitive with our competitors overseas, it's, it's very good for us to get on board with this. And if you're still not convinced, I really like what conservative Republican congressman, or former conservative Republican congressman, Bob Inglis said about this. And by the way, I got to meet him in January. Super nice guy. This is what he said about it. I would suggest my free market colleagues, especially conservatives, who think that climate change is a bunch of hooey, the Chinese do not. He said they plan on eating our lunch this next century. They plan on in innovating around the problems and selling to us, the rest of the world, the technology that will lead the 21st century. We may just press the pause button in America, trying to figure out what to do, but China is pressing with the fast forward button. So, why is a revenue neutral carbon tax good for our conservative friends here? Number one, it has broad support already among conservative economists. We pollute less while lowering the, possibly lowering hated payroll and income and corporate taxes. <coughs> it does not add to the federal debt or federal deficit. It's easy to administer. There's no big federal bureaucracy added. It does not pick, pick winners. The free market picks the winners. It fosters personal responsibility. Again, the less you pollute, the less you pay. So it hold, you are held responsible. And finally, it keeps us competitive with China and Europe while being a big job creator. So after going through, and thank you for this opportunity here, Larry, after going through and learning about this, I know now three things for sure about mine. Death, taxes, and a carbon tax <laughs> is good for conservatives and you.